Hi, I'm Graham. I'm a golfer who's passionate about technology and also a caddy in the north coast of Ireland. Me and my team are on a journey to create an app for the golf caddy industry. And while we're at it, we want to speak to as many interesting people creating exciting projects within the golf industry. I believe the future of this game is bright, my friends. And this is the Future of Golf podcast. The following is an episode with Grant Creighton. Myself and Grant have in many ways lived parallel lives with Grant also being a caddy and creating technology for the golf caddying industry. In 2013, Grant started building an app called Looperlink, uh, which connected caddies to golfers in Southern California. In this conversation, we go through Grant's journey through professional golf, uh, his life as a caddy, and also the highs and lows of building technology for the golf caddying industry. If you do enjoy this episode, please remember to uh, like and subscribe as it's the best way to support this podcast. And also check out Grant's links down below. I hope you enjoy it and leave any feedback you have. Hello guys and welcome back to the Future of Golf podcast. This is episode number six and I have the absolute pleasure of interviewing another fellow caddy, uh, Grant Fritt. Grant, how are you today, my friend? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you, Graham? I'm awesome. Uh, for full disclosure, this is tab number two of the podcast. We had a few, a uh, couple of technical issues yesterday, um, but we are we're all sailing and ready to go today for a fantastic episode. Um, so yeah, Grant, you're obviously based in California. Um, what what time is it over there? You're eight hours behind, are you? For me? Yes. So sounds like you're working late on a Friday night, and uh, it is twelve o'clock or a little after twelve uh, noon in San Diego. So Yep. Uh, we got an eight hour difference, but here we are. There we go. Make it work. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, that's it. I, I'd usually probably be working on Friday nights anyway on the idea or, um, you know, yourself yeah. spending long weekends, um, working yep. on stuff. Um, I, I suppose because your endeavors are still quite entrepreneurial. You mentioned real estate there. You mentioned crypto before that. Um, sure. how do you, do you try and take a little bit of time off in the weekends to sort of forget about it? Or do you have a day where you forget or, or what's your working schedule like? Yeah. So um, currently uh, I'm a real estate agent. Um, uh, def- definitely spend a lot of time uh, in the crypto world, a um, little bit of investing here and there. Uh, and then, but the weekends are typically busy for real estate agents, um, yeah. you know, where they're showings, that's when your clients are available. So the work week just, you know, you don't even know if it's a Friday or a Monday. It's just kind of like if you have work in the real estate industry, you do it. If you don't, you're kind of off. So um, it just depends on the day. I've got a showing today at 3.30. So, uh, you know, get to do a podcast in the middle of the day and then go do a showing and then so, we'll see how the weekend plays out. See if, the, see if we're writing offers. Yeah, I'd say yeah. the dream for you would be to sell golf course real estate if you could get into that business, or maybe maybe if sure. got into that. For sure. I mean, a lot of my contacts have come through the golf world, so um, you know, a lot of golfers want to live near their golf course, whether it's private or public. So um, yeah, it's golf's golf's a great um, industry to be in for real estate. Yeah, even watching the PGA Tour events like uh, like Kapalua, the Mexican event, always stands out to me. Yeah, yeah. You look around the course and you see these phenomenal mansions around the for place sure. and you're just like you can't imagine who actually owns yeah. that um yeah yeah it, it, so it'd be, good, it'd be good fun actually and um i'm sure you can arrange a few rounds of golf as well to to make with yeah. the people too business stuff yeah absolutely golf absolutely well I'm, I'm actually doing this interview so that i can come out and visit you in northern <laughs> ireland and we'll go play a few courses up there so that, yeah. that... <laughs> for sure for sure um yeah i mean you, you said you've never been as well so i mean i would love to there's there's a great loop of golf courses where I'm from. It's uh, there's three courses called Castle Rock, Port Stir, which was the British Open host, and then Port uh or sorry Port Rooks, the British Open host, and then Port Stir is right beside that, and they're all about sure. a 15 minute drive away. Um, nice. and then you've got the whole north side of the island. Um, there's a, a county in Ireland called Donegal, and it has yep. some fantastic links courses as well. Um, all the yep. Irish listeners will be will be shouting out the names of that. Um, but yeah, absolutely, you're you're more than welcome. Um, and yeah, I appreciate it. That that actually, I suppose, it brings us on nicely because a lot of visitors from America obviously come across here and they hire caddies um, for playing the links courses. And uh, obviously, you were involved in a venture within the caddying industry. Sure. Um, so I guess taking it back to the start of that journey, 
I guess I guess how did you get into the caddy and space in, in the first place? Sure. Yeah, so obviously we've had a conversation before this that we kind of went over a few things, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll reiterate to replay. whoever ends up watching this to uh, yeah, yeah, give a little bit of replay. So um, yeah. I grew up in Colorado, which is in sort of, uh, the Midwest or the mountain area of, of the United States. Um, I grew up a basketball player. I played golf a little bit, um, just sort of on the weekends with buddies, and then I ended up going to the University of Kansas. I tried to walk on and play bas- college basketball there. I played a year at the University of Denver. And then my senior year in college, um, I started getting into golf more, uh, and um, I ended up uh, in between my junior and senior year of college. I ended up catting for my parents joined a golf club super late. I ended up catting for the head pro in the Colorado Open, and he ended up placing third in the Colorado Open. Um, a guy by the name of Boyd Summerhays won it that that week, and yep. Boyd's now the coach for Tony Finau. Um, uh, Let's see, uh, Wyndham Clark, who's on the PGA mm-hmm. Tour. I used to ba- I used to babysit Wyndham Clark. So I lived That's across the, the street from Wyndham Clark growing up. Um, so I remember when he got his first hole in one at age six. But uh, <laughs> so when I was a senior in college, when I caddied, that was the first time I had seen golf as like a sport that was like, mm. holy shit, this is a, like good golf is amazing. And Boyd just striped it. My Like my guy was solid. I mean, obviously placed third in the Colorado Open. He won like nine grand. You know, he, I was the first time I've ever got paid as a caddy. Yeah. They uh, still have 10% ever really... there. But, well, yeah, the fact that, you know, like we, we sort of had a pre, you know, he's a, he's a head teaching pro. So like yeah. him winning nine grand, he, uh, you know, I thought I'd get like 900. He hooked me up. He gave me like six or 700 bucks. Um, so not quite 10%, but I didn't, you know, I didn't have my caddy contract set up by that time. Cause <laughs> it was the first time I'd ever caddied. Yeah. But um, that was that this is this is what got me into the caddying and golfing space was like when you actually have just played with your dad or played with your buddies and like you can break 80 you know it's like you're you're the best golfer in your crew but then all of a sudden you see real golf and you're it, mm. like light bulbs were going off left and right you know it was like oh they do this the good golfers do that because i think when you're a caddy you actually have the ability to like really pay attention to the small things, but you're, and you're detached from the result mm. on, on enough of a level that you can actually learn. And that was, I learned so much more about golf in one tournament caddying than I had ever learned as my, as 18 years, an 18 year old or a 20 year old, um, that I had ever learned playing. Obviously yeah. I knew enough about golf to like, for my, for my head pro to ask me to come out and caddy. But that was the first time I saw golf from like the perspective of like, holy moly professional golf is what i want to do in my life mm. so i ended up caddying at a course called castle pines in denver where they used to have this course a uh, tournament called the international it's the stable for the original stable for scoring um tournament uh, on yep. the pga tour so i caddied there for a summer um ended up making a ton, a, enough money to move out to san diego to start pursuing professional golf after college mm. so um and i, I the way I got into professional golf was I ended up playing in my first ever tournament um, a- after I graduated from college, which, which was a U.S. Open local qualifier event. And I went to college with Gary Woodland. Gary Woodland was the number one golfer when I was there, the guy that just won the U.S. Open. Yep. And I ended up beating him in terms of score at the U.S. Open local qualifying. And I was like, OK, like I can play like I didn't qualify. I didn't move on to sectionals, but yeah. I like played well enough to beat Gary who was like KU's number one golfer. And, I, you know, I broke 80 in my very first ever tournament. Um, I think I shot 78. You know, Gary shot like 80 or 81. He went on to <laughs> do a few things on he the PGA right. Tour. No, so that, yeah, he's, uh, all right. he's doing okay. He's doing okay. But um, that, you know, caddings what got me into like, okay, golf is really cool. Mm. It's not just fun with the friends. It's like something that I really want to pursue. So then I ended up moving out to San Diego with some caddy funds. And then I got to San Diego in the, the caddying atmosphere around Southern California, at least in San Diego, wasn't anywhere near as robust as it was at Castle Pines. Mm-hmm. So I, I caddied a few courses in, in Rancho Santa Fe, but they didn't really have a caddy program. It was sort of like they'd hit you up when they had guests that came yes. in. One of the guests that came in was a guy named Danny Lee. Um, before PGA he won the USAM. Well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So before he won the USAM, the first time he ever came to the United States, he ended up at this golf course in San Diego. He had never seen the course before. So um, I'll, I'll give a quick little story about caddying, which is kind of fun. So Danny Lee shows up with like an entourage. And I think he's 
like technically New Zealand. Yeah, but he's Asian. I, I, no, I think he is. I think he's of Asian background, but grew up in New Zealand. Uh, yep, yeah, yeah. So. so, yeah. Okay, so he shows up, um, and uh, most golf courses in San Diego are po like the greens are po, but this this course called Rancho Santa Fe Farms had bent grass greens, so there was some grain to it. Um, and the third hole at this course is a super difficult par five. It's like, it's got a dog leg to it. It's got basically, it's got gunch on both sides, out of bounds, right. You've got a, a hazard left. Um, and, uh, so he stripes his drive. He, we're even through two. He stripes his drive. Um, and then this, this hole is something you, you just lay up on. It looks enticing to go for. Mm -hmm. So I was like, let's lay up, let's lay up this way with like a four or five iron. And he pulls out his three wood, puts it in the water makes an eight. So now we're three over through three, but he basically went against what I had said. So mm -hmm. throughout the rest of the round, I, I, in like, he would, he had missed a few putts early on in the round. And I was like, Oh, you're just not reading the, the grain appropriately. Mm -hmm. So he had never really played golf on a, on a, on a green with, with, with too much grain. Mm -hmm. But from that point on, all he did was listen to me. And it was like, he was so good at golf. And I knew this course so well, that I was like, and I figured out his game super quickly. I was like, okay, you hit, let's, let's use this club. Let's, we're playing this yardage. Yeah. He ends up shooting, um, he ended up shooting 68 that day. So the rest of the day, it was just like, he had never seen the course. Caddy was like, hit this shot right yeah. there and he could do it like that. And so that was sort of like my, I was just like, you know, caddying if, if with a, with an amazing player on a course that they don't yeah. know as well, like you can actually provide a ton of value in terms of shooting mm -hmm. a good score, at least your first time out. So, um, but that, that was interesting. I was teaching, I taught Danny Lee how to read green and <laughs> in green. So the, the amount of people you get to run into through yeah. batting and through playing golf, I mean, it's, it's, it, if you're in the network, you're in the network. So yeah. I think it's amazing um, but that for, was for, for young people to get into, especially because it, nowadays, like the younger generation spending so much time indoors and so much time on social media that a solid wreck right. of five hours to go out in the course like people don't do that anymore now like no. I, like when i grew up like i spent my entire summers before i got into golf like i was out in a, a bike or i was playing with my yeah. friends and now like I, yeah. I look around my neighborhood and there's there's no children out playing which is just it's bizarre and obviously covid hasn't helped that as well um as well like the point you mentioned about like really providing value to players i think it's really fun as a caddy like when you make a real difference to the players around. Um, so I had, For sure. had an American guy come across and in Ireland, we have uh, really steep bunkers. So they're really difficult to get out of. You'll maybe see them in the open. Right, right. For sure. For and sure. this guy had headed in. I think it was a way to approach shot and he was completely plugged in the bunker. And he just, he never had a player in that sort of lie. Um, but I, I was taught growing up the technique out of that is sort of close the face down and come really steep and just kind of hood it, hood it and just yep. stop on it, but put all your force right. into it. So he said, there's no way. And no, no joke. He just hits it. It rolls out to about an inch and he just goes berserk, high fives, <laughs> the whole group. Oh yeah, metal. for sure. And, uh, for I sure. think I got a nice little tip that day as well. Um, Ex exactly. And that's fun. Like it's, that's the fun. That's the joy of catting is kind of like, there's some grunt work to it. And obviously not, not every round goes perfectly. Yeah. But, um, when I, when I was catting at Rancho Santa Fe, um, I had a, it was, it's mostly, um, four catting. So one caddy for four players, um, you're hopping on the back mm -hmm. of carts and you're like running or, and you're like, you're, you're basically helping four dudes. So it was like, it was like $120 base fee. And then anything else you earned as a tip was, was your tip, your cash tip. So, um, so it's basically 30 bucks a player, which like, that's what I, anyways, we'll, we'll get, we'll get into like what I like would like to see out of like, you know, uh, and I think what you probably understand as well. Um, but anyways, this, this, you know, you can, you can pretty quickly tell like who, which golfers are, are not so great. And the other ones, which are better, like you can figure that in a couple holes. And then, um, um, and it, 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 when you're a four caddy, you end up always having to work harder for the worst player, right? Cause they're hitting yeah. more shots. They're in more bunkers. Like you're, you, you basically are like the good players. You're like, you're giving them yardages. You're giving them like a little bit of advice, but in terms yeah. of like, you know, like clean, cleaning clubs, raking bunkers, you're, you're working for the, hard, yeah. the worst player. So we're, we're on like the 14th hole or like 13th or 14th hole at Castle Pines. It's a part three. And um, so they're playing different tees and all the tees are, are tiered. And so like, you help the one guy, uh, the t two best players on the top tee, then you're going down the next tee. And then, you know, like by the 14th hole, it's like, all right, this guy is like 15, 20 over par. 
and it's like, are, am I going to run down to another tee and help club this dude? But like, it just depends how hard you're willing to work That's as it. a caddy, right? And how how into everything. So I, I end up like running down to third tee, and I'm, you know, this guy has I've built a little bit of trust with him in terms of like now I know his yardages, his clubs. He has one club in his hand. I was like, hey, look, like this one plays this distance. It's so downhill. We want to land it right here. Let's use this club. I hand him a different club. I'm like, let's aim it right here. He aims it. He hits, he hits his whatever shot. It lands exactly where we talked about it landing, and it rolls out, and it goes right in the yeah. hole in one. <laughs> this dude is like 65, never had a hole in one, never played golf with the caddy before. So like at the end of the, I mean, this guy was elated, yeah. right? So like he had never, you know, like he had, he hadn't ever thought properly on a golf course, right? He had never had someone walk around with him and coach, you know, not coach him, but like, just, Hey, like, this is your game. This is this hole. Let's do this shot. And he gets his first hole in one and, you know, he, he hooked me up with a hundred dollar bill afterwards. Yeah. I think I made, you know, you made good money that day, but those are the joys of caddying when you're like, you can actually support a player who's maybe a 15 or a 20 or a 25 handicap. And they get a hole in one for the first time in their lives as like a 65 year old. That's, that's amazing. That's cool. Now that doesn't obviously happen every time. Yeah. And a lot of times like you can in intimidate the, the, the worst golfer by being a caddy and they're frustrated because they're not playing well. And so I get it. There, there's always a, like an emotional balance to work yeah. with players, but um, sometimes it works. Yeah. Out. I think a big part of it as well, as you say, is uh, like reading what the player wants out of their round. So you might get like, yeah. a lot of really good golfers that come across here. understand. I want to beat my best score. I want to ship below 75. And then you get sure. guys turning up at the tee with a 12 pack of beer. They've cracked the door oh, yeah. open. Oh, yeah. And uh, they bring oh, yeah. their little Bushmill whiskey bottles with them and they're sick of them in the oh, first yeah. tee. So you, you have to be sensitive to that and you have to say, right, I, I'm sure. here to make their experience the best it possibly be, yes. regardless of what score no they doubt. shoot. Um, and no, no, I, no I don't know of many industries like that and caddy is very unique in that sense um and like ultimately the caddy spends the most time out of everyone in the golf course with the person i mean it's it's a four and a yeah. half hour conversation yeah. so you get to know them very yeah. intimately yeah. um so it's yeah it, it's a, it's a it's a cool industry i mean you never know who you're caddying for and you never know the things that you'll say and where that leads down the road after caddying if caddying isn't your full-time profession for your whole life which for most caddies it's not it's it's kind of an introduction to golf it's uh, something to do to make some cash and then and then you move on in life but the the people you can meet through caddying is that 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 that's some good people absolutely so. okay so w uh, definitely granted not part of the fun that uh you have a you have a clear passion for caddying um so how did that then yeah. translate to a business venture like at what point did you realize that sure. this could then be an opportunity okay so um i moved to san diego after college which was in 2007 and then i played professionally for six years and i caddied to kind of support my my professional golfing habit which it never turned it quite into the profession that i would have loved to um so after six years i kind of like was like all right i'm gonna take a break from professional golf um and i'm gonna get into i'm gonna get my real estate license and so I'm sitting in real estate education, like courses, and they're talking about brokering services. I had had a good friend from college who was like a top 15 employee at Uber. Yeah. And so I had the opportunity to kind of see that, that app model that connects a service provider with a user. And I'm sitting in real estate education with my background in caddying. And I see this like, okay, you know, there's a lot of things that are going to become the Uber of, yeah. what, of whatever their industry is, whether it's niche or not. And so in 2013, I had this light bulb go off in real estate education course. There needs to be um, a platform, an app, a dedicated app that connects golfers with caddies for a number of different reasons, um, which we can get into kind of, mm -hmm. you know, the, the added benefits of, of, what, of what it is. But like it was like right, when you have that like initial like like jolt of, oh, my God. This is, and that's just who I am entrepreneurially. Like I want to, I want to, you know, play professional golf. You know, I want to be my own boss. I, I I'm sitting in real estate and I cannot think about real estate at all anymore. Cause yeah. my mind is still super in love with golf. And like all of a sudden I have this business idea in golf. So, um, yeah, so, uh, I, I ended you know, when, when you don't know anything about building tech or you don't know anything really about entrepreneurial business other than kind of like through, through mm -hmm. a golf world, 
I had a lot to learn. So I started talking to absolutely everyone I knew, you know, just pitching like, hey, what do you think of this idea, X, Y, Z? And then I finally talked to some lawyers because I was like, do I need to like get intellectual property on this? Um, and I talked to, I, you know, it's just like the more people you talk to, the more they're like, go talk to this mm -hmm. person. And I ended up talking to a really smart lawyer who said, look, there, this has nothing to do with intellectual property because you're not developing any new technology, but what you are doing is you're building a marketplace. And if people use your service as a marketplace, the, the, you might be able to build something down the road that has some IB to it. But at the end of the day, you need to build the okay. marketplace. You need to build the tech in the marketplace, but there's nothing to yeah. protect. And you can do a copyright on your name, but that's about all yeah. the money that you should spend on, on sort of like intellectual property in the beginning. So um, he introduced me to this group called the Founder Institute. Um, and the Founder Institute is a, um, it's like a silicon replica of Y Combinator. Mm -hmm. um, and Y Combinator is dedicated, you know, they now have a, I think they now have like a, sort of like a satellite operation that goes, you know, like a, a you know, so that they, you don't have to live yeah. in Silicon Valley outside of San Francisco to do Y Combinator. But at the end of the day, um, the way that the, uh, the way that the Founder Institute was set up um, was, and the Founder, the Founder Institute was started by a guy named Adeo Rossi. And Adeo Rossi is Elon Musk's really good friend. If you ever read Elon Musk's biogra uh, biography, um, you'll you'll come across a Deo Rossi's name. So this guy knows what he's doing, but he has a, 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 an incubator in Silicon Valley, but then he also created satellite incubators in major cities across the world. So, and it's basically an ideation incubator. So you, you go from ideation to, you know, execution and venture capital and potentially exit. And so they just sort of like facilitate early entrepreneurs on their journey so that you make sure you don't spend money or do things in yeah. the wrong order. Um, they help you get incorporated with a C corp or an S corp, as opposed to an LLC, because it's more friendly for investors. So anyways, they kind of guide you through the entrepreneurial yeah. process for people that aren't necessarily entirely familiar with it. Yeah. Um, so I ran into that group and I started working with them and a bunch of other entrepreneurs in San Diego on the idea. Um, and then we can get further into that, but that, that was sort of my Genesis idea, sitting in real estate education, talking about brokering services. And I'm like, oh, there needs to be yeah. an Uber app brokering caddies golf courses and yeah. golfers so which i'm sure uh, how did your how did you come up with the the same idea or did you see what we what we had put out uh, no i mean I, honestly I, like I, when i came up with the idea i was convinced i was the only person on earth that had forgot about it and i lived that illusion for about two days until i looked online i was like yeah uh, there there was emergent technologies I'm, I'm not sure i saw yours but i saw uh i can't remember the name maybe caddy now or something like that um and there was another okay. one club right. that i saw um so i was like but i was sort of encouraged by that because i knew that there was an early sign of something yes. like this going on in the u.s and i mean it wasn't crazy i, I knew um yes there was someone to be had there um but for me it was right basically i was still in university at the time and I was going to these business events because I wanted to do something entrepreneurial. Like I knew I had it in me. I just didn't know what avenue I wanted to put the energy into. Um, and they talked sure. about idea generation and they said the best way to identify a business idea is to think deeply on the problems that face you on a personal level. So I thought, yep. right, no let's doubt. think here, Graham, what problems face me. And uh, straight away, Katia, just the amount of time uh, waiting around the club for jobs, um, waiting for phone calls. Yep. Um, and then after doing a bit of exploring yep. on the club side, it seemed that there was uh, an administration side to carry in as far as um, just yep. like paperwork and phone calls, you know. So, and then I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, bingo, yep. here we go. Um, so that, it, it's a it's yeah. a fun time Great. as well you. whenever you create that because you're like, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the, the fun, fun part. Yeah, that's <laughs> the fun time. <laughs> <laughs> you're far enough yeah. along that we can say that is exactly the yeah <laughs> and it doesn't ever feel it doesn't feel like it's going to be that much work by the time you, you've come up with the idea because you can think of all these ways that it's going to work and and like it's just like yeah we just make the apps do this and it's just like okay but to actually make an app work is like okay now there's uh, a whole another level of, of yeah. problems it's to so, solve. I, I feel like we've honestly been parallel in that point because i think we're both non-technical founders oh yeah for sure and when i went to my app yeah. developers like i had this vision so i maybe came to them in i want to say november 2019 um and this was obviously pre-covid so my vision was 
uh, we would have this marketplace for uh, American tourists to book caddies in the UK by, uh, I wanted to launch yep. in April. And the technical guys were like, right. you have no idea how long this will take to build. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, oh God. Yeah. So it, it's yep. a humbling experience whenever you realize that like code just for doesn't sure. um, appear out of thin air. Yes. Um, so yeah, yes. I guess from that first idea then, like, did you try and build a yeah. team around you straight away or, or what was your approach to that? Right. Yeah. So um, I kind of went through this three and a half <laughs> or four and a half month long incubator in the Founder Institute. Um, and that started in like uh, October of 2013. I graduated in er in early spring 2014. Um uh, with sort of like, okay, there's your idea. It's it's sort of flushed out. You've done some market research. You now understand that you have to like find technical co-founders. You've got to find um, venture capital. You've got to get, you know, what's your what's your minimal viable product look like? Where you're not spending too much money, but you're flushing out the idea. And how how willing are your customers or your service providers willing to work with basic tech in order to solve a problem bigger and better down the road? Um, and so that, uh, so in 2014, um, I sort of kept working on the idea myself. I started, you know, um, I had, to, I, 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 I went through this thing called San Diego startup weekend. And in that weekend, I was actually able to get sort of a front end minimal viable product, pr uh, created with, with like a team mm -hmm. of six people. It's, it's, it's a cool little process where, um, I think like. 40 people showed up on a Friday. Everyone gets a 60 second yep. pitch. There's a bunch of other people in the audience, in the, in the audience. And then, um, after, after the 40 people got to pitch for 60 seconds, people that were in the audience had a, had a sticky note and they could walk around and find the, the, the entrepreneur with the idea that they wanted to spend time with that weekend. And so I got like seven or eight stickers placed on on me like literally <laughs> all over me <laughs> and then and then so i was one of like seven or eight people uh, or ideas that were allowed to get flushed mm -hmm. out that weekend so if if you had an idea but you wanted to stick around for the weekend and work with someone that basically had an idea that was intriguing mm -hmm. and other people want to work on um yeah, so i got some and there's just people that show up that just love startup ideas and they just spent will spend all weekend but i ended up with this front-end designer that helped us design an actual front so I could walk around at some at like mid 2014 and show people yeah, like so here's had a the demo app. Of it? and obviously it had no it, it was a yeah. front end demo it had no back end it, it but it was a front end demo and it basically said like I'm you know are you a caddy or a golfer if you're and then it would do a little bit of like flow of get to the point where you could mm -hmm. like book a caddy so um that helped me show up to golf courses show up to golfers show up to venture capitalists and say like here's sort of the conceptual design on it um, and then you got a ton of like basically feedback. And so that's when I was like, okay, so I went to 60 golf courses in Southern California, um, in San Diego. And they all uh, showed them like, Hey, what do you, you guys want to have a caddy program? What if we created this app and we had caddies, would you allow mm -hmm. this type of service to go on? Every golf course was like, sweet idea that we need to get caddies back into the game. Let's, um, cause in America caddies have literally fallen off the map. It's just not quite the. It's sort of a leave me alone. This is my time mm -hmm. away from people. Yeah, yeah. You know, Southern California is 20 million people in it. So when you get on the golf course, it's kind of like the mm -hmm. less people, the better. You know, it's like you're paying for yeah. people to stay away yeah. <laughs> as opposed to paying more money for more people to come along. So there's just a little bit of a different um, vibe at Southern California mm -hmm. golf courses. Um, and carts, are, every course is built for carts. So like less people walk out here in the States than do in than mm -hmm. Northern Ireland, I'm sure, when they play golf. Um, so anyways, um, then I, then I put my head down and then I, I had the PGA show in 2015 on my radar. I was like, I'm going to go to the PGA show, see, see if anyone in the, cause that's like yeah. the business of golf, right? You're going to show up. There's every single cart company, every single clothing line, all the club manufacturers, um, anyone and everyone who's at, I mean, if you watch the golf yeah. channel, you'll see the PGA show it's aired every January you were there this year as well. Um, and so I showed, no. No, I haven't been, I went, okay. two, I went two years in a row when yeah. I was working on this. Um, so, but 2015 was the first time that I went and I ran into, um, a guy named David Cavosa and David Cavosa, um, my idea was called mm -hmm. looper link. Like looper is obviously a nickname for a caddy. We're linking people. It's alliterative. His, his, he was actually working on the same project. He's I'm based in Southern California. He's based in Virginia and he had named his company looper. 
So all of a sudden, and, and you make your way to kind of like, there's some caddy displays at the mm. PGA show, like things that caddies might use or whatnot. And we ended up at the same, you know, what uh, that's crazy area in, in the in the PGA show. And, you know, you start talking to people and they're, and someone was like, oh, well, some other guy, wait, you're with Looper? And I'm like, no, Looper Link. He goes, oh, well, there's a guy named David that has the exact yeah. same name, the exact same idea. You should meet. So I ended up meeting up with him. Our first meeting was sort of like, it was, was, tense, a, it was a little thinking, bit yeah, like stealing each other out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just like, just like neither of us had done this before. You know, both of us had the same idea. You know, you start, you know, but at the end of the, at the, I just wanted to be like, look, we're the only we're the only fucking people in this world that are thinking like this at 2014. Like this is either a big enough idea that and you're going to need people to work on this, or there's no point to compete. Like I'll, t I'll head up the West coast. You head up the East coast. Let's combine all of our resources. Let's work on this together. So by the end of the PGA show in a few meetings, we had sort of like on a handshake deal. We're like, yeah, let's like see if we can work together. And so we ended up, and he ended up becoming caddy okay. now. So like I was, so him and I basically, you know, like, uh, he did like a market research in terms of like, should we, should we keep the name looper or should we, you know, in terms of SEO search, you need the word caddy in it. Um, in terms of, of just when you say what it is, you know, um, like not everyone, the golf understood golf industry did understood what yeah. looper was like, no one knew it, crazy know, it wasn't, it wasn't a big, enough, it, even, it's a, I know, yeah. but it's just such a better name, like Looper or Looper Link. I, I like, but at the end of the day, you have to have. I, I guess I don't know. I, I still like would love it to be Looper. I mean, I think like once you get the product big enough, I would have advocated for changing the name back to Looper or Looper Link, um, as opposed to like Caddy now. But um, at the end of the day, um, we ended up working together, uh, supporting each other. Um, he's the one that put up a majority of the capital. Um, I was able to. I was working another job. He he had the ability to put more money in. So he mm -hmm. was sort of in control of the business and he was such a better CEO than I am. Like I'm not a CEO. I'm a, I'm a business development executive can help a, a group, but I just don't mm -hmm. operate like a CEO. I just don't, it's just not my personality type. Um, so at the, um, at the end of the day, like uh, after like, so I, so once we, so Dave, David ended up putting up the money to develop the actual mm -hmm. app. So we ended up having an actual app. It was, and it turned into caddy. Now we had, um, liability insurance for the caddies. We had liability insurance for the golf courses. And I showed back and I showed back up at every single golf course that I had spoken to and said, here's the tech, here's the contract. Let's get this thing rolling. And every golf course in Southern California was yeah. like, whoa, 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 whoa. Board, board meetings. No, thank you to, you're going to steal cart revenue. We don't want to manage caddies. Uh, we don't want to deal with them having to, you know, like, it, we we had answered every question that they might have, but at the end of the day, it just sort of became real um, for them. Each like, golf course once, was like looking through his yeah. wireframes and going, yeah, I might use it. Is right. Like in even my experience, I've seen yes. that it's like it's once so, you present the actual product, they're a little bit yeah. more like oh, we're we're gonna actually have to pay money for oh shit for this, this product. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A little, little bit of pushback you face then when you present the real thing. Oh yeah, a ton, I mean for 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 a, about a year and a half, I, I couldn't couldn't get a single course in Southern California to adopt the actual technology. Um, and then so like I was working another job, and you know like three and a half four years into a venture, you know like mm. I just ran out of steam. Especially when, I, you know like if you looked at the pro formas that we built, there's fifteen thousand plus golf courses in the United States. And for it to pencil at like the, the, the things that we, you know, like we didn't want to gouge caddies. We didn't want to like charge courses to, you know, to run a program. Um, it, we needed like a third of the golf course in the United States to do a hundred to 200 rounds a year. And, and, and some of the ma more major ones to be doing, you know, that, that in a month, uh, month in month out. And when you get to like 45 courses and you've spent X amount of dollars and you're getting a, uh, a caddy booking fee of seven bucks each, you know, each course is seven, you're making 700 a year per course and you're at 50 courses. So like what's 50 times 700, that's not a mm. business to like, <laughs> that's where, that's where, that's where I like kept doing the math in my head. And I'm like, look, like I, I, we're either too early or, and then I have some other opinions on what, how I think is the best way to roll this thing out and like be a technical service provider yeah. in it for this industry that eventually mm -hmm. become a big company. But it's just going to be a it's going to be a twenty year venture before the before the company starts like 
utilizing its network to build mm -hmm. actual wealth. So, um, but yeah. we can talk about like the advent of Web3 and, and, and what your guys' revenue model is. And I'm happy to kind of like play yeah. venture capitalist to you to help you guys pr progress. And, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, even, even past this, I'm sure we'll have other calls uh, regardless. Um, Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. I was actually just going to ask, this yeah. sort of falls on quite nicely. Um, so I guess in like, if you're taking just like first principles, if you were to sit down with a completely clean slate now, and say, how do I build this to be a sustainable business that obviously solves the pain points of caddies, um, connects golfers, um, I guess, where, where would you start with that then? We'll, we'll, we'll dig into it. I mean, I would... Yeah, I would, I would start with finding 10 good caddies and getting all 10 caddies involved um, with some, maybe a little bit of form of equity or at least some type of referral fee equity or some form of like, hey, anything that you guys do, um, the company's not going to take any of your caddying revenue. So like at the end of the day, your main product as, as Handy Caddy or Caddy Now um, is your caddies. Um, and so especially if you're going after like caddies that do it for a living first. Right. So I actually went up to Bandon Dunes to talk and this is sort of getting away from first principles, but I'll try to come back. Um, mm -hmm. So, and I'll try to leave this in. So I went up to Bandon awesome. Dunes, you know, Abandoned Dunes is, sort of blank style. Um, yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's, 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 it's an amazing resort in Southern Oregon on the coast. It's got gorsh. It's got a very linksy feel to it. Um, so I have played some links golf cause I went up there to go talk to caddies. Better both. Like Better both. <laughs> so, but they, they had a, they had a whole caddy shack. They had developed their own software system in order to manage mm -hmm. their caddy program. Um, and they just, they had put a ton of capital, at least energetically and money into managing their own caddy system and to present them with an app that isn't the, scheduling system that they had put forth, which is sort of their first principles of how to manage caddies. Um, that's when it, that's when it was just like, you know, like, and, and you talk to the caddies and the caddies were like, look, we, we, we operate on primarily a cash basis. Like for, for us to start to like incorporate digital dollars, well, that's going to be like something trackable by the yeah. IRS. That's going to be something that, that all of a sudden they're, they're looking at you as the enemy and you're looking at a caddy, like, I'm trying to like improve. I, I don't want you guys sitting around um, waiting for loops. I don't want you guys having to get, not get paid what you think you're worth. Like set your own. I wanted caddies to be able to set their own rate um, based on their experience, based on their reviews. Um, and I wanted caddies to be able to, if you ever don't want to live in Bandon Dunes and you're this service provider as a caddy and you love doing it for a living or at least a hobby, like this is going to be a, a, a platform where you might be able to live in LA, mm. service seven or eight different golf courses on your own time, on your own schedule with golfers that are also rated and that you have your own price point and you know what you're going to get. So I'm like, I'm trying to get you, you to have the opportunity to really take advantage of being the entrepreneur that you are as a caddy, as opposed to, or the, as opposed to you're a caddy yeah. within the band and dune system. So, so you have, but like at the end of the day, like they, when you, when you live up in Bandon, Oregon, there's nothing else around. And if you're a caddy, like you can make good money and we'll like, why, it, mess, yeah. why, why fix something that isn't technically yeah. bro broken for them? So, um, yeah. So, so in terms of first principles, I think at the end of the day, if, if you're, if you're not solving a problem that caddies don't want solved, <laughs> like, um, but at the like, there's still ways around, like there can be a booking fee and then tips are, or have, you know, not have to be in cash, but ca caddies can prefer tips in cash or something like that. So that, you know, that like yeah. the, the things that are trackable yeah. by, the, by the IRS are not. Absolutely. All, yeah. All I, digital. I, I think so. it's interesting because obviously like U.S. courses and obviously U.S. companies have emerged to try and solve this problem. Um, but there's, there's really been no digitization at all over my side of the water in, in the UK and Ireland where, there is this massive influx of tourism as well, um, especially in summers. Like a lot of golf courses would be flooded with requests for caddies here, and it just the staff are inundated um, with caddy requests. Um, like even when the Open was here in 2019, all the courses near Port Rush were absolutely right. flooded, um, and 
it, like our course doesn't exactly. even have a designated caddy master and so the two professionals yep. were running around trying to find caddies and like fair, fair play to them for doing that right it's, it, it's amazing um, for sure yeah so I, yeah i guess that's it it's like it's almost like a paradigm shift of um this is the way it, it's been done but um it's almost trying to right. present like the more more efficient way of doing things as a way to serve them and help them as well um that's right. interesting. You talked about the first, the first ten counties no being so critical to that, um, and I, I, yeah, I would like to think we're taking that yeah. approach with trying to work, trying to create networks for counties and Discord, um, and creating conversations there. Um, so it, yeah, it it really is an interesting yeah. one. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, if you could set up something where caddies can literally just put their name, phone number, and email, and general and and a list of courses that they're willing to caddy at like that's first principles of this industry where all of a sudden all you are is if someone someone says i need a caddy and they know of your company all you do is 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 provide them with a number of names phone numbers and emails um uh, or you or somehow you email the you know like all of a sudden then you're playing the same role as caddy masters or whatever but at the end of the day you're you can take a cut you know like take an appropriate cut for for putting together and look, a, a great go-to-market strategy certainly is targeting um, events like the op like the open. That when all of a sudden you have an inordinate amount of, of people showing up at a at a few select golf courses, and they're all looking for a resource that is technically scarce at that exact time. Th that's when all of a sudden you can provide a ton of value. Um, and all mm. this, because this is what Airbnb did. So Airbnb had their technology, had their technology built in like 0809 and the Democratic National Convention converged in Denver, Colorado. And guess what? All the hotels filled up way beyond capacity. So then all of a sudden people were looking mm -hmm. for other places to lay their head at night and participate in the Dem Democratic National Convention. This is when Obama was making his first run and Airbnb showed up and said, like to homeowners, they showed up to Colorado early or something like that. And they basically said, look homeowners that might are willing to like let someone sleep in the spare bedroom in in an over capacity you know you know point of time that's when that's when they started to to go off and they created these things like uh, they, they had a little like obama o's yeah. like oreos but they were obama o's and they had they, so like any anyone that stayed at an airbnb or like create an airbnb they dropped off all these it was just it, they basically took advantage of a situation in order to grow the idea of what the tech could do. Um, so if I were you, I you know like next target the open this year, go to all the courses within 50 miles of the open. Try to get a list of every single caddy. Go to all the youth golfers and say like every single high school, every single college golfer. Be like, hey, when the open comes, if you want to make a few extra hundred bucks for some for some caddied rounds, this is the network to do it. And then, and then once you get that like initial like fire starter put point where your tech works, you actually golf courses are like, holy shit, you helped us a ton manage this. Golfers are like, wow, I, you know, I didn't know I could find a caddy on an app. That's when it, that's when the yeah. idea will all of a sudden like jump off, off, off. Yeah. The, you know, it'll, it'll yeah. cross the chasm it, a little do bit. Do you know right? what? It was really funny. <laughs> Temporarily. So I'm actually moving to St. Andrews in a few months to work as caddy master at Kingsbarns. Good for you. The open nice. is held at St. Andrews this year. So wow. it, it's a it's a funny little one that but wow. obviously I have the network of golf clubs in Scotland. Um and yeah, I'm I'm massively excited about that opportunity to work as the caddy master while I'm working on this app and the site and um and learn a bit more about it. So that will be an education in itself. Um I think I think it's early morning still. I think you'll be up for maybe half five or six, but uh it'll it'll be different to my normal routine anyway. For sure. Um <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Well, that's cool. I mean, that's uh, honestly, you're doing the right thing. Like I, I, I was, I was doing this tech idea from the standpoint of having a complete, I worked at a health club in sales. Um, so I like had a whole separate life. I basically was living, I was doing, I was mm -hmm. tech entrepreneur half the day and I was selling gym memberships, mm -hmm. uh, on, on the other day to, to, you know, to put, you know, pay for rent and put food on the table. So, um, but you're doing the right thing by actually working mm. in the industry while also trying to provide a technical um, benefit to the industry that you're working in. So you're 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 in a much better position than I was at the time. I I had 
I wasn't into caddying. I had sort of burned out on professional golf and I really only wanted to play professional golf at that point. I didn't want to be a caddy. I didn't, I just wanted to be like a tech entrepreneur that like had access to all these golf courses. And I figured eventually like this app is going to work at Augusta and I'll just go play Augusta because I'm the founder of this app. Like that was my mindset was, you know, like I'll be involved with golf, but I don't want to do anything but play. I don't want to caddy anymore or be a caddy master. I just want to develop tech, help people. And then, you know, (laughs) you know, I had, I didn't have the exact all in mindset. So um, it it is, you're you're doing the right thing. uh, Having this thing running in the background at scale and then, you, you feel like everything's automated and you can just pop down to the golf course and live your life there. That that's the dream. And who knows? It yeah. may be possible for both of us one day. Um Yeah. So you never know. Yeah, what well, Yeah, I you never know. Well at least if you keep going, I'm glad I know you and then I can come out and visit you in uh in Northern Ireland and or Saint Andrews and you know, maybe I'll get a, a maybe yeah. maybe I'll hire, <laughs> hire one of your caddies on an app. That, I, I still to this day I'm like there is no doubt in my mind at some point in the future, you will 100% be able to hire a youth caddy, a uh, four caddy, a double bagger, or a, you you will be able to get the exact right caddy through an app um, at 99% of golf courses in the world. So um, eventually this is going to be, someone's going to have the fortitude to stick it out for 25, 30 years. They'll be massively rewarded for it. It's going to be a, mm. a lot of heartache between here and there and a lot of, you know, like other jobs. But uh, believe me, you're, we were, we were too early in the sense, I mean, Caddy now mm-hmm. still is working. Dave Cavosa is still working on it, but he, on, on some level, they've pivoted a little bit to like a, like a, he was really adamant that um, you don't go, that we don't go after the existing mm. Caddy network. He was adamant that you need to get mm. kids that have never caddied before and and teach them the game through caddying. But that so also you means you have to them teach them well. caddying. Um, and you have to so you have to train the caddy. So that so he basically got into like a youth training program and a youth like 1099 uh, independent yeah. service provider or service contracting business where it's like if there's a tournament at a golf course and you and you don't want to hire a bunch of additional help around the golf course. He actually had, not only are they caddies, but like they can just come out and support a, a big tournament at your course. And you can hire three or four of these kids for the day. And the app provides the ability for you to like contract work at a golf course with, 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 you know, like 16, 17, 18 year olds who are just trying to make a, you know, like they're, they're looking for structure in their life. So um, that, that was that, I think that that's the most valid approach. That's one of the a- approaches to take. That, that's an interesting um, one because that's almost so yeah. like an inter- in, try to say that word industry growing tactic. Um, so just like Uber, whenever their theory yeah. was, we have taxi drivers, yeah. but would a random person give someone a lift? Um, I guess our theory is would a golfer want a caddy? Um, so I guess what we're planning to do over the next few years is right. um, given the option to people in the UK and Ireland that caddying is a gig job that you could potentially do inside on the weekends maybe a day a week and make yourself a bit of cash and walk around the golf course um and it, it right. doesn't have to be this right time job you know you can yes. do it once yeah and what you're doing in turn no. is actually right like a golf club because um from speaking to clubs in ireland and the uk yeah. there's like a massive shortage of caddies um and i, I think i think it's almost like a barrier wow. to entry in that they don't actually know how to go about getting the job so golf clubs will put out um, maybe like a yep. recruitment push in maybe once a year in January or February, and then there'll be nothing through the rest of the year. Um, and they, the, their pull of caddies will be very stretched yep. to the jobs that they actually have to do. Um, so ultimately, our, our mission is just to grow the game sure. really and try and get more people carrying golf bags, make a bit of money. Yep. Yeah. It's great. I mean, so like, you can look at the business from the total addressable market is this, right? There, there's X amount of caddy rounds. Each of those caddies rounds it, uh, costs X amount of dollars and you can multiply that. But like what Uber proved was that there was actually a major shortage of cabs available for the rides that people needed. So, so Uber proved that cabs were underserving a market that was way bigger than the market that the cabs were providing, right? And, and half the reason why the cab industry wasn't providing these markets is because of the technology it took to mm-hmm. get the cab, right? Or to get a ride. So all of a sudden they made getting a ride no, you're okay. 10, <laughs> excuse me, 
a hundred times easier, a hundred times more, uh, you know, more efficient. And all of a sudden people were taking um, car, you know, like eight block Uber, uh, Uber drives when they're out at night instead of, instead of walking. And all of a sudden there's, there's a, there's mm-hmm. all of a sudden the market has 10 X, right? So you never know if the market will multiply on, si- on on its total addressable size because you provided yeah. the appropriate. It's worth a test anyway. It's worth finding out. Um. Heck yes. Heck yes. Yeah. No, I, I'm telling you, you're, you're like this. I want you to succeed because I want to be able to go to any golf course in Southern California and, and grab a high school kid that doesn't know a ton about golf, but it was willing to learn and, and wants to have a good day and teach them about anything they want to learn about and get, you know, like, or, or you go out with a group of four buddies and you're like, you, we just want to have a, a, a hit and giggle round or like, we just want to bet, but like, let's just bring a caddy because it's hilarious to have, you know, a 16, a 16 year old. Yeah. yeah. It's that's hilarious in a good way. Like, I'm not trying to, like, but yeah. it, it's, it, yeah, it's just like, yeah. Like if you're just out with the buddies and then you've got like a kid running along that, that like clean a club here and there, rake a bunker, they get, that kid gets to absorb what, you know, like middle-aged yeah. business people do at a golf course. You know, it's like, you don't know what their home life is like. That might be the, some of the most quality people they ever hang around. Um, and all of a sudden the, the light bulb goes off in their head, maybe not even necessarily about golf or catting, but just like about business and, and general etiquette, uh, conversational. So like it, I'm, it, it really makes me sad from like, okay. Mm-hmm. So Augusta That's does this TV, thing called yeah. drive, chip and putt. The, just the Wednesday before the Masters. And, and I'm like, yeah. And I'm, and I look at it and I'm like, all this is, is kids standing around in line and then waiting to hit three shots. And I'm like, how, like, that is not how to teach kids golf. Like, certainly there's going to be a, there, there's a few, but like, certainly it's teaching a few kids to like, you know, hit the ball, you know, it's like the simple basics of the game, but golf is like this complex organism. And, and like the only real way in the best way and the, the way that like Lee Trevino, all these like great time golfers, they all learn the game through caddying and they all had their own style. And now it's like kids hmm. go and get technical lessons. Yeah. And it's like, we have a bunch of robots out on course with no personality. Um, and like, how do we not have, how does the, so like my dream is that the PGA of America says, you know, like golf is mm-hmm. going through this explosion point during COVID, right? Because now more people have more freedom with their time. They don't have to spend an hour commuting to their job night and day. So they go out and play nine hole, or they go out and play golf in the middle of the day and they still get their work done at whatever point. So all of a sudden golf has had this explosion of, of interest. And I for the life of me, I cannot understand how the PGA of America, which is like mm-hmm. the the big organiz, uh, organization within golf in the United States, how they don't have a youth caddy development program. It blows my mind. And it like it literally pisses me off because go, caddying is the way that is the, is honestly the best way to learn how to play golf. When people ask me, mm-hmm. like, how did you get good at golf? I'm like caddying. They're like, well, how should I get good at golf? I'm like, caddy, go caddy for a summer. Go caddy for 30 rounds. You'll learn more in 30 rounds helping someone else golf than you'll ever learn going and playing 30 rounds. Once you've learned sort of like, once you like, and caddy for good players. So like, and but no one takes that advice. They're like, how do I get better at golf? Caddy. They're like, oh, okay, so I'll go to the range. It's like, no. do you want to get better at golf or do you just want to like go play? I'm telling you, caddying is like the, it's just such, there's no other sport that you can learn as much by half part, you know, like participating in the way that you do with caddying is yeah. like, it's, it, it's really sad and it pisses me off that the PGA of America has gone so far away from it. And 90% of the reason why PGA of America pros, they have so much shit on their table day in, day out. And it's dealing with members. It's dealing with a bunch of crap. They don't want to deal with a caddy shack. They don't want to deal with teaching youth how to caddy or they mm. don't like, they don't want to manage a caddy program. Well, guess what? It can get managed on an app. And it can get managed through a company and like how, how in this, how in the world on a Saturday in the summer at a great golf course in the United States or any, like it's, this is just, I'm frustrated because caddying so basically like non-existent in the United States, but it's, it's such a, 
it sounds like you can't, you just can't yeah. get enough caddies. You guys have a completely separate problem where golfers want to take caddies and no kids want to get off their phone and get outside. And it's like, so, so there is a, there is a certain, there, there's a number of different issues to solve. But I think if, if a kid all of a sudden sees like, oh my God, I can go make 50 bucks or a hundred bucks or, you know, like, uh, point <laughs> zero, 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 one of a Bitcoin to go play golf, yeah. like, uh, or to go caddy, like they're going to get off, they're going to get off their ass and, and, and go and go caddy and golf course is going to be like, okay, it's 90% easier to manage. Um, and the liability is taken off and there's, you know, so like eventually someone will figure it out. But I think somehow, some way I would encourage you to partner with whatever, with the Royal and ancient club within all the mm -hmm. UK golf, uh, golf clubs, um, as a way to like grow the game of golf, but it's managed through this app. And if you get a huge number of youth mm. kids that learn the game of golf through Handicaddy, you will have them as customers for life. Guess what? Then Handicaddy, you have you, you have access to the you have access to like the the genesis of their golfing lives as a youth and then they're going to be forever dedicated to the to Handicaddy for whatever else you want to like be 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 an organization that's bigger than just caddying. Yeah, right? there's, there's multiple you ways. Into, to expand from I mean, that, you can get into whatever like, you want. I think and, ultimately, and it's funny because we had sort of a, sure. a team meeting yesterday, and we were sort of setting forward our our, our five year vision. And I think it ultimately is just to grow the number of caddies in the UK and Ireland, and grow the number of caddies worldwide if we can do that. Um, and it's to create. Yeah, exactly. That, that's it. That's the core principle. Everything else will um, fall. But Grant, it's obvious that you're you're so passionate about caddying as well. Sure. It's great to to chat to someone that has the same passion for the game. I know. And uh, you're again, you're more than welcome to come across to the UK, and yeah. uh, I'll show you a good time around Ireland. And I'm sure um, we'll be glad to have you over here for sure. No problem. Grant, cool. that was it. that was a fantastic conversation. Um, um, I'm just I'm. <laughs> I'm just getting going. Let's 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 keep ripping. <laughs> no, I'm, I appreciate the time. Um, yeah, I'm sure we'll talk off the golf off the off the golf course or off the podcast um, continued. So uh, uh, maybe we could do a round two at some point if we get if we get if we get further down. Because I mean, I could talk about Absolutely. this industry for you know hours on end. Obviously, we've spent we've both spent yeah. a number of hours and days and years working on it. So. Um, but Graham, I, Hey, I wish you guys the best. If you guys have any questions from me specifically about how to raise venture capital or anything like that, I'm happy. To, I'll, I'm going to send you that. guys my wireframes for, uh, for the app that, that, that I, that I did before it became caddy now. So just so you guys have additional information. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate you putting me on the podcast and I wish you guys the best of luck and man, um, if we if we can grow caddying, then you're just going to grow the game, and and golfers will be better golfers for the rest of their lives Absolutely. if they if at 16 they spend a summer caddying. I, yeah. it's, it's, I feel it's, like that was like a free consultant no there for me for the so. past past 15 minutes. I should have had the pen and paper out just scribbling down points there. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, well, if you recorded this podcast, then you could go back and listen to Eric, it again. But it was just basically rats, me going on a rant. Rats are so. productive in some way. I, I believe like, yeah. you can always take something from it. Um, but Grant, absolute pleasure. Um, that was yeah, another episode yeah. of the Future Golf Podcast. Yeah. Thanks for watching the episode of this podcast. If you made it this far, you can continue the fun on Discord, our Twitter, and also subscribe to this YouTube channel.